Price, that's the number one technical indicator. You do best by investing for the longer term. If you can't explain what the business is doing, then that is a huge red flag. Some technological change is going to put you out of business. It really is a genuinely extraordinary situation. Hey everyone, I'm Ed Gotham and welcome to Opto Sessions, where we interview the top traders and investors from around the world, uncovering their secrets to success. Today, I have the absolute delight of introducing Adam Robinson, someone I personally consider a mentor, an incredible thinker who has a unique but masterful way of looking at the financial markets and how they operate. Adam is the founder of Robinson Global Strategies, where he conveys his wisdom on global strategy to some of the most prominent hedge fund managers and family offices in the world. He uses a unique approach that combines game theory, systems thinking, Bayesian analysis, and behavioral economics to outsmart global markets. He's also a chess master and an entrepreneur, having founded the Princeton Review after graduating from Oxford University, which helps students pass the tests that get them into their dream schools. In this interview, we discuss market mechanics, how a trend is simply the dissemination of an idea, the copper versus gold ratio that metal traders use to predict market trends, and the great game. Enjoy the show. Hi, Adam. Great to have you on the show. How are you doing today? Uh, I'm doing great. I'm excited by what comes out of our conversation. Yeah. Excited to share. I followed you um, for quite some time. I've I've listened to you on a Tim Ferriss podcast quite some time ago. I'm sure a lot of other people um, listen to it as well. And, you know, really insightful. And I've followed you ever since. So I'm really excited to, to finally have you on this show. I can ask mm-hmm. my own questions. Are you, in, um, are you in New York at the moment? Yeah. No, I've, I'm a lifelong, since I came down from Oxford, I, I've been a lifelong New Yorker. Yeah. Uh, but no, uh, in Tribeca. But no, I, I left last March. I've been away exactly a year. Oh, wow. You've yeah. Moved yeah, completely and, uh, or, or you're going back at some point? Well, yeah, I moved completely. I would say 90% of the people I know have left New York. Yeah. And some, about half of those are hovering hummingbird-like, you know, one or two hours outside of New York, hoping that okay. things will get back to normal and that they can return. But um, I don't think hope is a good strategy for choosing a place to live or, or, or certainly not trading, uh, trading equities. Yeah, yeah. So, so anyway, so I'm in L.A. I'm in L.A. at the moment. Um, I miss London, my favorite city, really. Is that so? And that's where you studied, is it? Was it not? Or? I, I, yeah, I read law at Oxford, but study is, you know, I, I spent most of my time taking dance classes and generally, you know, I, I was not the most conscientious uh, law student. Okay. <laughs> and um, what about life in LA? Is that going back to some normality yet? Or is it pretty? Well, kind of, kind of. You know, in uh, Texas, they've thrown all caution to the wind and basically just go about your business. Yeah, I saw that. Right. And so that, that, that'll be a very interesting experiment. So LA, like all places, is, you know, my problem is that on an animal level, when I go out in public, again, on, on a visceral DNA level, I expect other animals, other human beings to greet you with a smile and to move towards each other. But right now, everyone moves away from each other. Very centrifugal. And uh, so, and I choose not to put myself in, in public situations like that. Like pretty much hermit-like at the moment. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's very similar here. I mean, we've got the road to sort of opening up, but it, it's going to take until end of June sort of time is the what they predicted says so quite some time. Yeah. 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 Those predictions are, you know, and it's to predictions in markets and things, right? Yeah. And, and we should talk about that later. Be sure to ask me about the difference between anticipating and predicting. We could start um, there now if you want. Remember this time last year there, everyone was predicting that by the end of last summer, things would be back to normal. And uh, here we are, you know, a year <laughs> later, you know, making further predictions. 
So, so there. I mean, we could roll into that now if you'd like to start by, if you think that's a good entry to it. Or alternatively, I've got, um, I think, understanding your, your idea of the market mechanics and how it sort of works, you know, and it's driven by people as a sort of master of behavioral economics, game theory, et cetera. I think your insights on it will be very interesting to most people because it's completely different to yes. how a lot of the other people we have in a podcast sort of look at it. Yes. You've got that favorite quote for, by John Maynard Keynes, successful investing is anticipating the anticipation of others. Yes. So let me, let me jump in and discuss the importance of having a system. Let's start there. And then I'll come back to your point is, you know, people forget when I say people, I mean, fledgling investors forget that it's a, it's largely a zero sum game. And that when you're making money, someone else is losing it. Not always. Right. I mean, but that's the way to think about it. So it's a competitive, I, uh, on uh, Tim's uh, podcast, I said, it's like a gladiatorial pit. And or mixed martial arts, you know, that's the way to think about it. And that you're going up against yeah. other very sophisticated uh, traders and investors who are just as incentivized as you. And so it's critical that each individual have a system. System for approaching markets. And it can't just be, I'll look for undervalued stocks. That's not a system. Yeah. Right? You should be able to articulate how you're going to find undervalued stocks. Right? And anyway, so in the nature of a system, it was a Sir John Templeton, legendary investor, uh, who said, if you want to outperform the market, you have to do something different from the market. He said, outperform the crowd. Yeah. If you want to outperform the crowd, you have to do something different. So let's combine those two thoughts. Right? If you need a system because the world is too complex. And trading is one of the most difficult, I would say, I'd say perhaps the most difficult uh, human endeavor in the sense that you have to control your thinking and your emotions, mm -hmm. right? Once you start talking about money, people's emotions get triggered, right? Especially when you're talking about large sums of money whether the prospect of making it or losing it, right? And so, so you need a system to outperform. And you certainly want to outperform because if you, don't, if you can't outperform the market, you may as well just stick your money in an index fund and you know, go about your day, right? So if you're going to outperform the market, and yeah. very few people do, you need a system. And again, combining that with Sir John Templeton, you need a system that other people aren't using, right? You have to do something different from other people, not just for the sake of being different. That's not the point. It's just if you want an edge in the market, you have to choose a system built around your own idiosyncrasies and talents mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, um, we had a, you and I had a little conversation about chess and I'm sure we'll get into it. But chess masters learn that there's certain types of position that they do better in, right? Some people like slow, methodical games. Other people like games with a lot of tactics, a lot of action going on. And you learn to steer the game to those situations. Mm -hmm. So now, layering three thoughts. We want a system that's different from other people that is tailored to your own strengths and awareness of weaknesses. So for example, certain people may trade consumer stocks better than others. They just have a feel for consumer stocks, right? Mm -hmm. Or they have a feel for banking stocks, right? Because they got a good, good sense of interest rates, such. So they trade banking stocks or, you know, maybe your edge is in different time frames, right? Like your edge might be in, you know, one to three day trades, finding little opportunistic little situations that you get in and out ninja like. 
Mm -hmm. And, you know, your edge might be trading for the long haul. So you need every trader needs a system that's tailored to his or her strengths. And you learn that over time, right? In the same way that swimmers learn, oh, you know, like, for example, I was a swimmer and butterfly was my stroke. But someone else, it might be breaststroke. You, you learn what your talents are, right? And then you, you wait for those moments. You wait for those, those situations. And uh, it was Charlie Munger and, and his partner, Warren, said much the same thing. Waiting is mostly what they do. They wait for what they call fat pitches, right? A, a, a good to great company that they can get at a good price. That's the way they approach their investing. And by the way, when they say a good company and what they mean by a fair price, there's a lot of logic and thought underpinning that, even though that's a simple encapsulation. But mostly what they do is wait because <laughs> it's really hard to find a good company at, at, a, at, a, at a good price. Most companies are fairly priced. So it's hard to find a, a company that's not fairly priced in their metric, sorry, in, their, in their system. I don't trade that way. And so, so I say that just that each of us, each, any, anyone listening to this podcast, you need a system and it needs to recognize what you do really well. And then you hone that system, right? Um, and How do they find what they can do really well? Well, trial and error is one thing. Yeah. Trial and error is, you know, and that's actually, it's a really good question, Ed, and is that you need to, um, if in honing a system, when I say trial and error, it really, trial and error is not a random thing, although most people approach it like that. You want to be systematic about it, right? And you want to, have controlled experiments, as scientists say, right? And so when you enter a trade, it's very important that you be able to articulate to yourself why you're entering the trade. And that you could write little one paragraph thing. I'm entering this trade because it's oversold and there's evidence of buying in the sector, right? So let's say that's your reason, justification for buying a particular stock. And I'm going to enter at uh, 51, uh, 50 on a buy stop, and I'll exit with a 10% trailing stop loss. Let's just say that was your, you know, and notice that uh, you have an entry condition and also a, an exit condition. You want to be very systematic about things before you enter the trade. So let's say you enter the trade and let's say your, your sell stop is hit. Like day two, you're out. And so now you want to do what chess players call a post-mortem. Post-mortem is after the death, after the game. <clears throat> and um, so uh, chess masters, when they play each other after the game, the winner usually offers to the loser by way of uh, um, a gracious uh, a gesture to, would you like to go over the game? And the two of them, after the game, deconstruct the game. Imagine a boxing match where the two boxers, the winner says, well, of course, they're totally beat up. <laughs> but hey, in a couple hours, um, and after we shower, you want to go over the film footage. I'd like to show you what I thought you did wrong in the fight. <laughs> right? It's a really beautiful gesture, sportsman-like, yeah. and, and both parties learn. And so we need to do that after every trade, win or lose. Like, what did I do right? What did I do wrong? Again, this comes back to the developing of a system, is that you need to have controlled experiments. So for example, let's say uh, someone hasn't um, traded very much, in fact, has started off paper trading thinking that's a good way to kind of develop your skills uh, before risking real money, real capital. And after two months of paper trading and doing pretty well, the individual starts trading real money and then discovers after a week 
oh my gosh, it's, it's way different trading real money than it was paper trading. So that's an important lesson, right? Some people may do better um, in down markets, right? Bear markets or shorting stocks than, than stocks that are, you know, that they want to buy in bull markets. So again, you learn yourself and you learn, um, you learn what you do well by trying different things. And then you discover that you have an affinity, right? In the same way that a beginning uh, baseball player, say, learns, oh, you know, I, I'm, I'm really an outfielder, right? I don't have the reflexes for being a shortstop, say, or whatever. And batters learn what kind of pitches they do really well with, and they, they wait for those. So I say all of that, and one way that, you know, developing a system around your own strengths, uh, as you know, Ed, I, I'm a big fan of, of Jack Schrager's books, the Market Wizards series. Yeah. And uh, Tim asked me, what books would I recommend to everyone? And uh, I said, Tim, I can't answer that question because there's like so many great books. I don't even know how to begin to answer that. But I do know how to answer that for traders and investors. And that the, every trader should, should buy every book by Jack Schrager. And, and I think he's got five or six of them. And what he did yeah. and continues to do, he just came out with a new book, yeah. is he interviews the top traders and investors in the world. And he gets them to spill the beans on what they do. It's pretty, it's pretty remarkable because he just asks them pretty innocent questions. And you find these guys just spilling the beans on a lot of their, you know, secrets. Now, what's great about those books, and they really, if you're going to get the books, any good book that you intend to return to, you should get a paper <laughs> version, right? Not an electronic version so that you can annotate it. But those books, what they demonstrate with dozens of the top traders in the world, investors, is that each of them has a totally different system. Each of them. And what works for one, one isn't going to work for another. And, and you'll get lots of, you go, oh, I can use that little bit from, you know, Stanley Druckenmiller's system. I like that idea. I'm going to incorporate that. You know, which gets me back to one of my favorite quotes by Bruce Lee, right? Is hack away at inessentials and to borrow what works and make it your own, right? But borrow what works in, in other people's systems, what they've tried. So all of that was by way of a lengthy prelude to my system, right? How I look at markets. And, and, and so most investors use one of two general approaches to markets. And, and the first is fundamental analysis. And the mm -hmm. second is technical analysis. And, and, I, and I, I use a third way. <laughs> Um, but let me talk about fundamental analysis and technical analysis and why I don't use either. And fundamental analysis is, is the traditional mm, approach to analyzing stocks. And it was uh, popularized by Benjamin Graham, who taught Warren Buffett famously. And the idea is there to study companies and unearth companies that are selling for a lot less than their, I'm going to use air quotes here, their intrinsic value. Right? They got some kind of value. And to the value of, you do an analysis of all of Amazon's businesses and you discover, whoa, Amazon should be trading for $3,752. It's a lot less than that. I'm going to buy it. Right? That's the basic approach fundamental analysis, right? You study the world, trends and such, and companies. And the thinking there is that you'll uncover something that nobody else has uncovered. And for me, that's an untenable philosophical position. For starters, uh, why do you think, on what grounds do you think you're smarter than the market and are going to find something that no one else has found? Right? That's a problem number one. Problem number two is, is that even if you have found something 
uh, that was undervalued or overvalued by that uh, philosophy, um, how would you know that you were right? Maybe you were just wrong, right? And, and again, maybe everybody else knows something that you don't, right? So fundamental analysis for that is, is a bet that by the individual that he can, he or she can find something no one else has found, you know, good luck with that. And, and another problem, the final problem for fundamental analysis is this, this is that famous statement by John Maynard Keynes, the market can stay irrational a lot longer than you can stay solvent, right? So even if you find, again, I'm using air quotes here, an undervalued stock, and let's say you were God, let's say God has, has decided to start trading stocks, and he's determined, again, I'm using air quotes, the true value of Amazon is $3,752. Well, um, if people are irrational enough to underprice Amazon, what makes you think that they're going to wake up tomorrow and price it correctly? How do you know that? You know, so it's an article of faith that, that the actual price will, will over time converge on the true value. Again, I believe in a true value because um, I don't think philosophically it exists, right? And even if it did exist, I yeah. wouldn't know how to determine it. So technical analysts is the other major approach. And, and by the way, if, you know, Warren loves analyzing stocks, uh, Buffett, he loves to do this. He's having a blast. And, uh, you know, key thing about Warren, if you look back over his interviews over decades, Ed, there's one word that's appeared in almost every interview, and that is the word fun, right? He's having a blast. He loves what he does. He loves the way Jimi Hendrix loved to play the guitar, right? Uh, or Michael Phelps loved to set world records, and he loves it. And so you, that's another thing. You have to love trading. You have to love investing. This is really hard. And uh, one of my Mentors, Bobby Fisher said, if you want to get good at chess, you have to love the game. I think that's true with anything. You have to really love it. So anyway, so to get back now to technical analysis, what they do is they go, oh, I agree with Adam. Mm -hmm. There's no way you can determine the fundamental value. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look for patterns and that, um, that there are certain price patterns that are reliably predictive of what's going to go on in the future, right? So basically all quant funds do this, right? They look for historical patterns on the belief that that will repeat in the future. But technical anal analysis, my problem with it is that there are so many indicators, really dozens of indicators, that you know, or dozens of trend lines that you could draw on any given chart or whatever. And so there's an indicator that will justify buying a stock and also selling it at the same time, right? And so the technical analysis lacks overall a rigor that is replicable. Again, it comes back to what I said earlier about needing to have a system to navigate the complexity of trading, right? And the other thing about systems, by the way, two really key advantages is they help you control your emotions because you know what you're gonna do. And another thing is that having a system, you can improve it, right? If you just kind of go about your trading day, oh, okay, I'm gonna find yeah. a stock that's going up and buy it. <laughs> that's not a system. And so if you have a system, you can improve on it, right? You can get better and better because everything you're doing, you have a reason for doing it, right? You know, I used the example earlier of buying that undervalued stock um, after paper trading and then discovering, oh, uh, real life trading is a lot harder than paper trading. 
Oh, that's a good thing to learn. Most people learn it too late. So that's my problem with technical analysis. Now, by the way, there are people who use fundamental analysis really well, like they're really good at finding undervalued mining stocks, right? Let's say they know a lot about mining operations. So great. Okay. You have an edge. And if you consistently make money, then you should use that system, right? But don't trade non-mining stocks, right? So learn what you do well. Again, Warren and Charlie refer to a circle of competence, right? Learn what you do well and just do that one thing, right? Michael Jordan, one of the greatest basketball players of all time, some say the best, decided to try baseball. That wasn't his game, <laughs> you know? Um, but, uh, you know, respect for trying it. And so, so great basketball player, great, you know, not so great uh, baseball player. And someone may be a great trader using technical yeah. analysis of mining stocks. Excellent. You can get rich just doing that, right? So what I do instead, I don't use either of those approaches. And you cited one of my favorite quotes by John Maynard Keynes, which is successful investing is anticipating the anticipation of others, right? Which is very clever, which is figure out what uh, today, what other people are going to figure out tomorrow. And so not many people know this. Uh, John Maynard Keynes, an economist, was a brilliant investor. He ran one of the, I forget which, uh, Cambridge College. He ran their endowment. Uh, it was up 4x four, four over the Depression and, and World War II. <laughs> that's, pretty, that's very impressive. Yeah. But he, he offered no insights on, okay, well, how do you anticipate the anticipation of others? How do, you, how do you go about doing that? Mm -hmm. And so what I've done over the last you know, 10, 10 years is hone that into a system. Of, I'll give you an example. When, when bond traders and equity traders disagree about the world, right? so let's say bond traders are bearish and equity traders are bullish, I know that 19 times out of 20, the bond traders are right and early. So I know, for example, at, at major tops in, in equities, that bond traders have usually detected the problems weeks to months earlier and are already positioning for you know, a protracted uh, uh, downturn. Okay, well. So that's, that's one way. Uh, and, you know, we can get into later how I go about doing that. And again, it's you try to make everything really simple, which again, to come back to systems is your system should be a simple one. And you should be able to reduce it to a few variables that you can handle really well and then build all your trading and be disciplined around it, right? Another thing about a system is you have to have the discipline Ed, to follow it. Mm -hmm. And you have to be ruthless about that. So, so yeah, and a lot of times people, they, for example, somebody's system, they may yeah. say, I'm, I will never risk more than 5% on any one trade. And they say that to themselves. But then all of a sudden comes this juicy opportunity, they think, and they go, oh, I know I said I'm only going to risk 5%, but this is, this is like a sure thing. And they go, I'm, I'm going to invest 50% of my money in this trade. Right. And, you know, here's a this is really important. Uh, you know, I, I don't think I've talked about this on other podcasts, but since we're focused here on trading yeah. and investing is you should always be playful about it. And so when you enter a position, when you enter a stock. Or if it doesn't matter what you're trading, you could be trading, you know, futures or options, whatever you do. Um, if you're nervous about the trade, you've put too much money at risk, right? You should be able to be playful about the trade. And if you can't, you're trading too much money on that. You know, you're putting too much into that, that one trade, right? And so, um, so again, your system even there has to include things like position sizing, right? How much am I going to risk on any one trade? And what percent of my 
my capital mm -hmm. am I going to risk on any one trade? Yeah, a common error. And then again, <laughs> you have to be disciplined to follow that, right? And you know, there's that. I'm reminded of that movie. Uh, it's a little before your time, Ed. Uh, Top Gun. Do you, you ever see that movie? Yeah, yeah, yeah. of course. So, yeah, I know. Right. That. So in Top Gun, one of the key learning lessons for Maverick, right? And the sequel is coming out, I think, this summer. Was yeah, to have the discipline to stay with his wingman, right? And because before he was getting by on just his. Yeah you know, uh, aerial genius. But by the end of the movie, he learned the importance of, I will not leave my wingman. Even when it looked like uh, you're going to get shot down if you, unless you don't. So yeah, the importance of discipline. Mm -hmm. And that's, that takes a long time. So to be playful with, your, your, uh, with, with each investment, playful. And if you can't, it goes back to Churchill, you know, it, I forget whether I've mentioned this quote. My, one of my favorites, if war is a game played with a smile, right? And if you can't smile, step aside. So that's true with investing. Game play with a smile. And if you can't, you're over trading or you're putting too much capital. In. Yeah, yeah. You got to be playful about it. And even especially when large sums of money are involved, got to be playful. Because if you can't, mm -hmm. then you're fear-based and then you're in trouble. So there. Yeah. And are you able to tell us what you, you once said, uh, the world economy stock market is a product of our thinking? What, what do you mean by that? Just to, I think, these sort of fundamentals about why does price move? Yes. Very good. Good. Really great question. And so, so... The entire world is, is the product of our thinking, right? Again, John Maynard Keynes is successful investing is anticipating the anticipation of others, which is to say, anticipating what they're going to think, right? I want to know before the market does when they're going to change their mind about gold or about interest rates or about the, the, the pound, right? or crude oil, whatever it is. And so there's so many strands of thought here. So, shoot, I just lost my train of thought. What was your question again? It's about um, price. Like, why does price? Oh, yes, the product of our thinking. Yeah, that's it. Sorry. Because I wanted to introduce uh, uh, several new strands here. So the product of our thinking. Yeah. Of so what only matters about the world, about trades, is what other people think things are worth. Not what they're actually worth what people think they are. Yeah, a very important concept. Right? So, so, for example, now obviously they'll bump up against reality sooner or later, right? You know, whatever people investing in, in Bitcoin or Tesla or, or anything, stocks can move to the upside and downside to massive extremes, mm -hmm. right? And again, all that matters is what people think. So, so which is one of the flaws for fundamental analysis, right? It's like the true value is the only thing that matters. Well, yeah, but if you're the only person in the world who realizes the true value of, you know, Amazon or, or the dollar yen or whatever it is, good luck. So how do you monitor what other people are thinking, right? And, and I use the example of bond traders and uh, equity traders. So I'll, 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 give, I'll give everyone a, a simple indicator that I use, which is the credit spread. And one way to construct that on your charting service is LQD, long LQD, short IEF. LQD is the US ETF for investment grade corporate bonds and IEF is the ETF for the US 10-year. And maybe on the London exchanges, you can find equivalent ETFs. But you could just follow the US ETFs. It's the same thing. Yep. And so LQD divided by IEF uh, rises and falls with equities. 
except when it doesn't. And when it doesn't, it's a leading indicator for equities. So if you go back the last 15 years and you look at every major turning point of equities, every major turning point, either top or bottom, LQD divided by IEF, right? The ratio, long LQD, short IEF, is, um, has led that turning point by weeks to months. Yep. So I know if equities are going higher, right? Uh, FTSE 100 or uh, S&P 500, whatever index you're looking at, is going higher. And LQD divided by IEF is going lower. Then we've got a difference of opinion, right? Equity traders are bullish on the world and bond traders are bearish. And I know that sooner or later, the equity traders are going to wake up and realize they were wrong. And they're going to they're going to turn around and, and, and reverse their position and follow bond traders. So that's an example, a, a simple one, but a really powerful one. Right. That's a that's a really powerful, you know, Batman on his utility belt. He had uh, all these different gadgets and uh, an LQD divide by IEF is one of my top gadgets. It's one of my top <laughs> leading indicators. Yeah, so it's very interesting. Yeah. Leading on from that, I, I call like to um, in your from your perspective, what is a trend and why do they persist? Why do these happen? Ah, yes. Why? Do, what is a trend? Right. So traditional analysis, whether it's technical or or fundamental, offers no insight into the nature of a trend. Like, what is a trend? Why, why should trends exist? Right? After all, in, in the efficient market uh, theory, which people learn in business school, and you know, market is generally efficient, generally, overall, which is to say information about the world is generally known. There aren't too many secrets. And that that, that information is, again, I'm using air quotes here, properly uh, reflected in the price of whatever asset we're talking about, which, of course, I disagree with. And, you know, the, in the efficient market theory, the belief is if there's a new piece of information about something, that, that it will be instantly incorporated into the price of the stock or the bond or whatever. But that's not how people change their minds. So think about this, that every uh, investment decision is the expression of a view of the future. Every trader, every investor is trying to express a view of the future. So it doesn't matter what your decision is. If it's to buy gold, you're expressing a view of the future. Or if it's to short Tesla, you're expressing a view of the future. And your view of the future can be right or wrong, right? Or your, your logic or your, your, the means of expressing that view can be right mm-hmm. or wrong. So, for example, let's say you thought interest rates were going to go higher because of inflation. So, so somebody says, so I will buy gold. Well, you've got a problem there because gold moves inversely with interest rates. And if you thought there was going to be inflation, gold actually underperforms other commodities like oil and uh, copper. So there, your means of expressing that view, even if you were right about your view of the future, I think there's going to be higher interest rates, that you've not expressed that view correctly. So again, every investment decision in the world is the expression of a view of the future. And so all markets are just aggregating mechanisms for expressing the sum total of all views of all investors about the world. And so what is a trend? A trend is the spread of an idea, right? The spread of an idea. And, and one way to think about that, an analogy I use, 
is think about a crowded party. I know we're going to think pre-COVID, but think of a crowded party, say a, a New Year's party, and the place is packed, you know, hundreds of people, and everyone's having a great time. And uh, unbeknownst to, to everybody, the metal traders, say it was a party of investors, have looked around the room and they've decided, eh, the party's going to end. We're out of here. They leave. But nobody notices because there's still hundreds of people having a great time. But then the bond traders look around the room. They go, huh? No, I'm not feeling this. We're going to leave. And they leave the party. (laughs) And there comes a moment in every party when other people, I know it's happened to me. It always happens to me. I look around and go, oh, it's beginning to thin out. Like it's just begun. Right? But in fact, some far-sighted individuals realized the party was going to end and they left early, right? And in the same way, by the way, that uh, uh, that can happen in reverse. A snowball. A snowball, right. So that's the way, so I, that's the way ideas spread, right? And so ideas, whether it's around Bitcoin or Tesla or you know, um, any stock or any asset, right? So the world, for example, could be in the grips of of a deflationary worldview, that prices and interest rates are going to keep going lower. And that idea can change, right? And it'll change slowly. Some investors will begin to go, you know what? Uh, Next year, uh, we're pretty sure prices and interest rates are moving higher and they'll start exiting their, you know, deflationary trades and go into inflationary trades. They'll start positioning for that. And then that idea will spread Mm -hmm. and which is why trends happen. It's, is that it's the spread of an idea. It takes a while for an idea to take hold. And uh, so markets, rarely turn on a dime. Yep. When they do, they turn on a dime like at bottoms. People think bear markets are the opposite of bull markets. They're not. They're very different beasts. They're not, they're not opposites. And so, so often uh, on buying, uh, sorry, selling climaxes, you get a sharp reversal. Like that's just, um, but you rarely get sharp reversals at tops. You, you can get them when things go parabolic. Yeah. Right? With a, a stock that's gone parabolic, eh, it could have a sharp top to it. Like you take a look at GameStop, right? And that's, you know, an abject lesson in, in, in being able to navigate volatility if you're a day trader, right? Uh, um, but even a position trader. Yeah. It's interesting the GameStop you mentioned because I think it's an important concept is that, that these trends can persist even though they might be fundamentally wrong. Yeah. Purely because of the spread of an idea. Exactly right. And enough people get involved. Yeah. And that idea spreads. And, and you know, there's a great uh, George Bernard Shaw quote, one of my favorites. And uh, it was, uh, let me see, uh, 1895, I think. And uh, at the Drury Lane Theater and George Bernard Shaw, uh, uh, the play, it was the opening night of his play, uh, The Ar- Arms and the Man. And uh, at the end of the play, uh, it was a standing ovation. He calls for author, author. And so the, you know, the, great, the, the great Irishman gets on the stage to bow and a standing ovation, the entire theater. And uh, from the cheap seats, there's one lone boo. And, uh, and George Bernard Shaw looks up at the individual and he says, uh, you know, good sir, I, I quite agree with you about the merits of my play. But who are we to, to <laughs> dispute what everyone else thinks? And, and so if everyone thinks something is good, right? 
It's hard. Don't fight that. Really don't fight. Yeah. And, uh, you know, one of the, the, one of the sort of beginner mistakes uh, in the traders made in the, in the GameStop in their motivation is they, they were motivated by wanting to stick it to the hedge funds, right? We're going to stick it to them. Yeah. That's not a good motivation for anything. I don't care whether it's starting a boxing career or an investing career. Like one way for sure you're going to flame out is I'll show them, right? It doesn't matter in your dating life or, or anything. I'll show them is you're, you're sunk. You will show them, but not what you, you set out to do. You're going to show them that, that you failed. And so I'll show them again. It's not, that's not a playful state. That's pretty darn serious. And so, so you want to, as much as possible, be objective and detached, right? Yeah. It's also, it's a, it's a selfish statement, which I think, and, you know, many people think this way because we're, we're, it's how we are, but we, we think in terms of our perspective on the market rather than understanding just as you've explained that you're positioning yourself in terms of how other people are positioning themselves in the market, not what your, you know, not, not your thoughts on it. It's what other, other people's thoughts and how they're positioning themselves. Yeah. Well, you know, it's a, it's a balance. You need to have your own thinking, right? You have to have done your own analysis. Yep. Oh, which brings me to an important point. So you do your analysis, but of course you have to consider what everyone else thinks, Right. So like George Bernard Shaw, uh, I could think my own place sucked. But if standing ovation, I'm not going to fight that. Great. Yeah. Yay. Yeah, which is, is, we didn't get into it yet, but it's an important notion is, is the notion of confirmation bias and analysis, right? And seeing clearly. So... So it's really important. This is a very key mm-hmm. concept. I can't stress this enough. Like if there was one takeaway from this whole, you know, podcast, our conversation, it would be um, apart from developing a system is you need to form expectations and then draw conclusions. What happens when those expectations aren't met? right? That's so key. And again, and I talked at length with uh, Tim Ferris about this, about the nature of things that don't make sense, right? And whenever a stock, this is so important, it's really critical. Underline this in your notes. <laughs> if a stock is behaving differently from what you expect, you go, huh, that's weird then you're on the wrong side of the trade and you want to get on the other side, right? Let's say, oh, it makes no sense why Tesla keeps going up even though they miss their quarterly projections. I'm going to short Tesla. No, that's not too smart. (laughs) Again, when things don't make sense, when when a, let me put it differently, when a stock's movement doesn't make sense, and you go, huh, that's odd. But people might phrase it a little differently. They might say not that uh, that's strange that, that Tesla's going up. By the way, I'm, I'm just using Tesla abstractly. I'm not, I'm not, not a recommendation about Tesla. You go, huh, that's weird. Um, it keeps going up even when they miss their quarterly projections. Yeah, um, yeah. Then that thought, huh, that's strange is actually a sign that Tesla's behaving differently from your model of what Tesla ought to be doing, right? You have a premise that if stocks miss their quarterly projections, they should go down, right? Let's say that's your premise. And here you got a stock that's doing the opposite. Well, that means that not that the stock doesn't make sense, your model of the world is out of sync. That's what it means. And you might hear people say, they might not say it doesn't make sense. They might say, 
After all, how much higher can Tesla go? Well, a lot higher because you're on the other side of the trade still, right? You'll never hear someone long a stock going up going, oh, I wonder how much higher this can go. They're going great. Yeah. Yay, it's going a lot higher. So, so one is the notion of, of, of recalibrating around something that doesn't make sense, right? You could buy, let's say you short, uh, I'll pick a different stock. You short Ford Motor Company. I don't want to keep even automobile companies. You short, uh, I don't know, Citibank, or you short Bitcoin. And, and, and again, every trading decision, you should have a reason for why you did that. Like, I'm going to short it because this technical indicator or this fundamental analysis fact is, has not been discounted by the market. So there. I've got my decision, I got my exit rules, I'm in the trade. If it starts moving against you, again, something yep. that doesn't make sense, it's an invitation to, to either to exit the trade, but often to reverse it and get on the other side of it. And, and um, really, whenever I hear a, some expert on on Bloomberg or you know some financial show saying, which I don't follow, but if I did, and they're saying, oh, after all, how much higher can interest rates really go here? Well, I know they're going a lot higher, right? Because this guy can't even consider the possibility that they're going any higher, right? So I know that I know the idea hasn't fully spread because that viewpoint, right? Had, there's still people on the other side of the trade. Mm -hmm. so, so that's really key. And, and a question that I've shared always, and I'm going to share it with, with your listeners here, is what precisely would I need to see to tell me I was wrong? Right? On every trade, what precisely would you need to see to tell you that you were wrong and should get out of the trade? or reverse it even, right? I was wrong, oh, <laughs> I'm not buying Tesla, I'm gonna short it now, right? Or whatever the, whatever the decision is. So it fights confirmation bias because going into the trade, again, you have your reasons, you enter the trade. Now, the only thing that you should be looking for is what do I need to see to tell me to get out of the trade? which is anti-confirmation bias, right? What most people do is they look for evidence that confirms their decision. Like they go long, I don't know, banking stocks. Yep. Right? They buy a banking ETF. They're long banking stocks. And then every day they're looking for evidence that banking stocks are going higher. No, you should be looking for evidence that to get out of banking stocks or to short them, right? Once you're in the trade, then it'll take care of itself. You just got to know when it's, <laughs> uh-oh, it's moving against me now, time to get out, right? My initial thesis isn't playing out, I'm out. And um, so, yeah. I was just going to say, um, I just before we move on from the trend uh, side of stuff, how do trends begin? We've talked about how, how, you know, why they exist. Yeah, that's such a good question. So how do they begin? You know, <clears throat> I tell people if you're trading for really long term, like multi-month to multi-year, what you can do, really, someone could make this their system, which is simply this. You just find any long-term chart. And by long-term, I mean like at least a year long, but probably longer, move in consistently in one direction, right? Consistently in one direction. Like up, down, sideways, any direction. Right. Well, not, well, it could be side, well, mostly, mostly up. Let me deal with up or down. We'll deal with sideways in a second. That's kind of its own separate case. Because there are only three ways the trend can change. And, and, and I'll, I'll tell you them right now. 
So let me deal with the most common case. And this is a way to find trades. You look for a trend that's been in place for a long time. So for example, I know at US stocks, pharmaceutical companies have underperformed the uh, um, other um, healthcare uh, sector stocks. Drug companies, pharma, has underperformed. And so over the last, I don't know, seven, eight years or so, drug companies have underperformed other healthcare providers. So if you had gone uh, long healthcare providers and shorted pharma, you, you'd have done really well. <clears throat> and, and so you look for a trend, which is to say the spread of an idea, mm -hmm. right? It's gone on for a really long time. And then you look for evidence of a change. And that change will always mm -hmm. happen in the following way. So again, if you can picture this, a stock that's been going up consistently, say for up or down, I'll just say up, for say you know, five years. And you can be sure that everyone has extrapolated that for the next five years is gonna keep moving in the same direction. That's just the way the human mind works. But some far-sighted individuals will change their mind and they'll exit all of a sudden. So again, you, let's say you've got a stock that's been moving up consistently, I don't know, 15, 20% a year for the last five years. And then one day out of nowhere, the stock drops 10% or 5%, some really sharp drop. Now what's happened in that moment is that, is that some far-sighted investors realize that the trend is over and they're exiting, right? They're leaving the party early. You get this sharp 5% correction or whatever, some sharp drop, you know, one, two, three, four days. Now, everyone who's thought that this stock is going to keep going up forever, right? Because it's been in this long uptrend. What do you think they think of that 5% drop? They go, wow, it's undervalued. It's oversold. And they bid it back up. It starts to climb again. Now, the far-sighted individuals, they're out of their longs. In fact, their position's short, but they've placed their bets. So the stock begins to rise back up because, I'm, again, I'm using air quotes here, it's undervalued, oversold. So it starts to rise. And then the original far-sighted in investors, it gets back close to its old highs, go, oh, great. No, we can short some more of it here. And, and, that, and then rolls back again to the downside. So, so there are three ways a long-term trend can change. And that is, and I'm covering the first case, which is the most common, a sustained trend, whether to the upside or downside. And you look for a sustained trend. Then you look for a sharp counter trend move really sharp, like a two or three standard deviation outlier move. And that'll, mm -hmm. that's the first sign that the far-sighted individuals are, have exited the trade. So what you're waiting for is for the stock to go back up, to be bought back up by everybody else, and then roll back again to the downside, begin to roll back over. That's a, a really powerful um, uh, replicable pattern. So sustained trend is the first condition. Sharp counter trend is the second condition. The third is it begins to float back up, resume the original trend and get close to the, the old high and then begins to roll back over to the downside. That's a really reliable pattern for trend change. And again, it's just the reverse on a downtrend, right? That's the most common way a long-term trend changes. So your question to me was, how does a trend start? Well, one is just the ending of an old trend. That's a good way to find things. The second way is, a, is an extension of the first, but when the uptrend has gone parabolic, right? And there, 
the first drop is usually sharp and you don't get the you don't get the, the leisurely crawl back to the old highs. So again, uh, case two, I considered case one, case two of trend changes is a move to the upside or downside has gone parabolic. Right? A long-term trend that was pretty steady, but then it went parabolic. And there, when it changes, it'll be a sharp, a sharp drop. And then sort of it'll bounce back sharply also, <clears throat> but nowhere near the old highs. And then it'll roll back over again to the downside. That's the second way. Mm -hmm. And the third way is a stock that's just been kind of moving sideways for a really long time. A stock or some asset class just been moving sideways for a really long time. So let's, let's think about that. You know, so there's a, a stock that's been moving sideways, say for a year or six months. It looks like nothing's happening, right? Because it's just moving sideways. But in fact, what's happening is that's boring, right? Stocks moving sideways, that's boring. So what's happened over that period of time where the stock has seemingly done nothing is that the people who get bored have sold the stock. And the people who have discipline and are far-sighted have been buying it. So really a stock moving sideways is, is a sign of incredible strength because what's happening is the weak hands, the notion of you know, the undercapitalized traders or traders looking for movement and action have given up in disgust. Like, oh, I'm out of here. This, this stock's going nowhere. So that's really reliable is the stock is just scanned. You know, there are mm -hmm. all sorts of great charting packages um, um, that you can use and just scan for stocks that have gone nowhere for six months or a year, right? The percentage change is basically flat <laughs> for a really long time and really tight uh, daily ranges. Because when that starts to take off, Whoa, that really motors. It's a very reliable uh, trend. Mm, I don't want to say indicator, but a trend detector, right? That's the sound is how do you find a, when a, a new trend has started? And I've just given you the only three ways. That's it. A lot, right? Mm -hmm. Now, trends can start out of nowhere. I mean, you think about COVID kind of came out of nowhere, right? Right, so sometimes it can come yeah, out of yeah. nowhere um, with no warning, um, but those are those are really rare. Uh, most of the time, the world is isn't that discontinuous, you know. And uh, so those are the three ways. And again, to tie back to our earlier conversation, Ed, is y you might discover, oh, I like I'm really good at market tops, right? Like, so I'm, I'm going to specialize in shorting or I'm really good at, at detecting bottoms or these longer term. I, I like patient accumulation. And then, and then when it finally takes off, I, you know, can scale further in. Yeah. Okay. Into the trade. So yeah. there, that is a really good question. Oh, thanks very much. That's really interesting. We hope you're enjoying the episode. For interviews like this every Thursday, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, make sure you give us a star rating and leave guest suggestions along with any other feedback in the review section. Now, back to the show. Can we briefly just uh, talk about who you are and where, where you got to today from your, your perspective? I think it'd be, I mean, you've led a very interesting life and done many things. And I think it'd be interesting to get your, your perspective on it. Yeah, so... So I, I was at uh, I went to Wharton undergrad, which is a business school in the states, and uh, like uh, Buffett was went to Wharton undergrad, uh, and a uh, little before me. <laughs> so I went to Wharton undergrad, and then I got a law degree at Oxford, and um, I came back to the states, and uh, I thought actually that what I wanted to do was write 
write novels and screenplays. That's what I thought I wanted to do. And, um, and I, I thought to myself, well, how do I support myself? Because it's going to be years before that pays off, years. But really, I, I knew that, well, not I, I knew, but I, I just assumed that to support myself as a writer would take five years. It's kind of what my five years to kind of support myself solely by writing. So I thought, how do I support myself in the meantime before I sell my great novel? And I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll tutor kids. Because I, I knew if I went to Wall Street or, or a law firm that uh, I'd never find the time to write. I'd just be exhausted, you know, and I, and I could kind of switch up in that yeah, world yeah. and have fun with it and go, oh, I, I never wrote. So, so uh, in the States, uh, there's a test called the SAT. And, uh, and I had always been a very, very strong test taker. Not a, I was never very conscientious as a student, but I take tests really well because I'd worked it out to a system. Yeah. And so, so I started tutoring kids and that about a year later became the Princeton Review, which we were going viral. Wow. We were like doubling in size every couple of months. This is pre-internet, way before the internet. And Really? And uh, yeah, really, it was so crazy because the system I had created around taking multiple choice tests, no one had ever thought of before. And this wasn't software, sorry. Is it- no, no, it was actual courses that you would take. Okay. Yeah. And, and um, so that was my first, you know, um, interest. But even there, I created a system. Right? I've always really important to develop yep. a system and you test everything. You know, I say test everything, having an experimental attitude. Every trader should have an experimental attitude. And every great in every field has this attitude. And the experimental attitude is to try things and see what works. And if it doesn't, you're ruthless. You just, okay, I'm not doing that ever again. And to find and to hone a system over time. And I had to do that with improving kids' scores, right? Because it was a very, just like markets, a very unforgiving metric. If people want to know whether Adam was mm-hmm. a good tutor, well, it was real simple. You just look at kids' scores, right? How much did they go up? How much did we expect kids to go up? And if it was more, Adam. Adam contributed value. So it was very easy to measure whether I was doing a good job. And I was doing a great job. <laughs> and anyway, so that became a national company. I sold my interest in the early 90s. I became, uh, in the early 90s, interested in AI. Yeah. Really interested in AI. And at the time, this is like 25, 30 years ago, um, wow. AI was a, a backwater you know, field, even in computer science, yeah. like really, if I, I could be talking to a computer scientist, he'd say, so what are you doing these days, Adam? I'd say, well, I'm really into AI. What are you doing that for? The, and the reason was, uh, so I was into, I've always been interested in minds and thinking. And the state of the art back then was expert systems and, and neural networks. And but the problem was that computers were really slow. And, and so for me to run an experiment on a neural net to set up a model and see whether it was good model, I'd set up the model, hit enter on my computer, and then walk away for a week. It'd take really a week. <laughs> Number crunch. Wow. Finally, you'd get an answer. And you go, oh, damn it. <laughs> that did <laughs> I'd tweak the model and hit enter again. Wow. And now those same experiments can be done in milliseconds. So what's really improved AI is, is uh, processing speed, right? And so, mm-hmm. so became interested in that. And then I went to work with a friend of mine in the late 90s, early noughts, a guy named Victor Niederhofer, who um, was at one point a partner of Soros. And he was a friend of mine. He said, Adam, you have always such an interesting way of looking at the world. You should get back into markets, right? You went to Wharton. Why don't you 
look at that. So, so that's what I did is began to study markets and, and um, so that's how I got that. So that's the trajectory. And the common denominator for me was an interest in thinking, yeah. right? Whether it's the students thinking about how they analyze questions to, to markets, how do traders think about, about the world? And, 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 and again, anticipating their anticipation. So that's, that's the, by way of background. And, and again, the common thread yeah. for, for everyone listening is, to if they look back over their lives, even if they're 25, <laughs> um, they will notice a pattern in things that they did really well in school or in their pursuits. And that sort of self-awareness of their talents and their predilections, just what they love to do. Like I love creating systems and then tweaking them. I like doing that with measurable results. Like I can go, yeah, I did a good job yeah. today. I don't mean like a pat on the back. The system was correct. And, and so I, I, it's what I love to yeah. do. And, and, and every trader, everyone listening, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, you should, should really love it. And if you can't love it, you need to be detached, right? You need to be either yeah. stoic or playful about it. And stoic is really, and when I say stoic, when, again, Bruce Lee, one of my favorite philosophers, he said, one of the most important lessons in, in life is to learn, sorry, is to master how to remain calm, calm. And I'm sure that when, people, when you hear that, the first thought is, oh, calm as opposed to nervous. But no, calm also is opposed to mm. excited, right? And you need to, so if you can't be playful about trading, at the very least, you got to be stoic, right? You can't be, don't get despondent when trades move against you and don't get too excited when they're moving in your favor. Just you got to be detached, play the system, yeah, right? And uh, one of my favorite Michael Jordan quotes, he said once, he never thought about missing, never once in his whole life did he ever think about missing a shot. And the reason he never thought about missing a shot is this focus was 100% on making it. So there was no room for anticipating whether the shot would go in or not. It either will or it won't. And if you've done your analysis with a trading system and, and, and you've decided to buy or, or sell some particular stock for some particular reason or set of reasons, that it will either work out in your favor or it won't. And if it doesn't, that's okay. Yeah. Because no system is going to work. It's always a matter of probabilities, right? If you had to wait for a trade to get to 100% conviction, the trade is over, right? By the time everyone is 100% convinced, oh, yeah, this stock is yeah. going up forever. That's the market top. So, so it's really a, a matter of knowing what kind of risks to take and to calibrate your decision around that, really risk management, position sizing, all of that is, um, is critical. You mentioned earlier about um, Warren Buffett wanted to keep it fun. So is it, is it then you've got to remove emotional detachment to a level that you're comfortable with but can still have a bit of fun so that you, to maintain interest or do you, do you think complete detachment is what you've got to nurture? Well, so Buffett didn't say to have fun when you're trading. He just loves to analyze stocks. I said he had, he has fun doing what he does. He loves to analyze stocks. Really. If he had loved playing the drums, he would have been a drummer. 
right? And because that's all Buffett, he just loves analyzing stocks and he's really good at it. And also analyzing himself, right? Buffett and Munger both, knowing yourself is so critical, right? It's not just, oh, I'm, I know a lot about stocks. Yeah, well, good luck if you don't know much about yourself, <laughs> right? You really have to know yourself. And so, so the, the point I was making there was Churchill's statement, it, you know, war is a game played with a smile. And if you can't smile, step aside. And you got to be able to trade like that, right? And so I know once I've done my analysis, whether to buy or sell, that I know exactly what I need to see to tell me to get out of the trade. And I've decided that going in. And so how that plays out in the world, I don't think about that anymore. Mm -hmm. In the same way Buffett has talked about this, when he buys a stock, he doesn't think about it anymore. He's made his decision. And so, yeah. so now he turns his attention to finding another stock to buy, right? Another company to buy. Right? That's what he does. He buys companies and holds them forever. That's his secret. That's what he does super well. Yeah. So um, to either be playful or to be stoic, I think playful is the more is the more powerful state of being. But if you can't, at least be stoic. Yep. Be detached, right? And, uh, you know, it's, it's um, I don't care who you are, Tom Brady doesn't complete every, every past, right? And, and not every, you know, a, a batter does really well if you hit one, yeah. one pitch out of four, you get on base. You're doing really well, hitting 250. And with stocks, heck, maybe your success rate is, is 30%. And, but you cut losses really quick. And your, your winners just go on forever. You could do really well with a 30% hit rate. Uh, but even there, you have to know yourself, which comes back to system and predilections, mm -hmm. right? Certain, you know, certain people might might not be able to tolerate that. They'd want to be right. Yeah, uh, I think it's really, really interesting. The learning over time element, because um, I've I've been through that myself, and like for example, I'm I'm much more comfortable, like per in my own trading, adding to positions once I've got ahead, you know, as a sort of a sizable amount is moving ahead. I, I will add to that position and double up on my not double up, but I'll, I'll you know double down on that position. Much more comfortable doing that than and moving my stop to break even. It's just a comfortable trade that I become detached from, even though the size is bigger than my normal size. I'll go in. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm just comfortable with it, and it's something I've just learned over time. And I I, I use that to my advantage in situations where uh, you know things like that happen. But I only learn over time that that was something I was okay doing. Like, you know, it didn't make me make bad decisions after that. Right. You said something and I, I actually want to jump on it because I, it's an important point, um, which is stop losses. Mm -hmm. So someone says, I'm going to buy this stock and set up, you know, a 10% trailing stop loss. Right. And they're going great until they wake up on Monday morning and they see the stock has gapped down 30%. It's blown right through your stop loss. You thought that I'll get out with a maximum 10% loss. Oh, no, you haven't been around stocks that have gapped down 20 or 30%. Mm -hmm. Then your, 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 your starting loss is 20% now. You thought you could get out with a 10% trailing loss, especially around stocks that have gone parabolic. That's really, you've got to be really, really careful. You know, stop loss is, you know, the way to think about a stop loss is if it hits this price, my sell order is now effective. That doesn't mean you're going to get out. You're not, you might not find a buyer at that price. Yeah. Right. So to be careful about that. And um, again, especially when stocks have gone parabolic mm -hmm. 
And then, and then the question is, you know, when they've gone parabolic, uh, maybe taking some of your chips off the table. Yeah. Right. Taking some um, famous investor, Bernard Baruch, once said that he got rich by buying too late and selling too early. <laughs> right. He, he, he didn't try to catch the bottom and he didn't try to catch the, st- the top. And, and traders can do this, you know, they have a system and let's say a 10% trailing loss, let's just say. And by the way, that's, I don't use that, but I'm just using that as a simple kind of thing. And they go long a stock, but it, their sell stop is hit, they're out of the stock, and then the stock reverses and doubles from where they sold it, kicking themselves. Like, oh man, I sold too early. No, you followed your system. And the importance in following a system in the long term is way more important than, oh man, I should have overrode my system and stayed with it. Yeah. Interesting to know, um, because you're also a chess master, that's right, isn't it? Yes. And um, I'm interested to know if you've learned anything through your chess playing days that you might have applied to to investing in your investing systems, uh, such as you mentioned on Twitter the other day, overprotection. You didn't actually mention it, I don't think, in terms of investing. But, yes. Um, yeah. Very good. So, so, so yes, I, 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 I'm a chess master. I don't really compete at it anymore. Um, when you get to a certain level, like I'm competing against other masters they're, who are into the game. They're younger. They really care about the game. And, and I don't anymore. I mean, I love the game but I don't have the time to compete at it, right, at, at that level. So, um, so chess was my thing. Uh, I was mentored by Bobby Fischer back in the day, leading up to his winning the world championship. And so I love the game, and it's taught me a lot that I can apply in, in investing. But I, I want to tell everybody, regardless of whatever they did, whether it's playing the guitar, they got really good at playing the guitar, whatever your thing is or was, there are lessons that you can apply in trading. So for example, you could have been a whiz at biology, right? And and then use biology concepts in trading, right? So whatever your thing is or was, you can carry over key things from that domain into trading, right? And so for chess, I'll tell you one of the things that's different about chess, which is anti-trading, is that in chess, the rules don't change, right? The board is real simple. <laughs> well, the, the situation, the, the pieces can be complex, but it's it's... It's just 32 maximum pieces, right? 16 of mine and 16 of theirs before they start getting traded off the board. And, and it's only 64 squares. And so, so everything that I see, I see everything that my opponent sees. Mm-hmm. And the rules don't change. But in, in trading, they change all the time, right? You could be in a bear market or a bull market, like, day to day. And sometimes interest rates going higher is good. Sometimes it's bad. You, you got to know what, what regime you're in. And, and so, so one thing about, about uh, chess is it's, it's not a great metaphor for trading in general because of that, because I know everything my opponent knows. We all see the same board. There's no hidden, it's not like poker, which is a game more of probabilities. And I don't know what the other guy knows, right? I can't see his cards, right? It's a matter of probabilities. So, so but that said, chess, um, one thing about chess, it teaches you the importance of developing first, again, what I talked about earlier, what we discussed, a system, knowing what kind of positions you like to play. Right, there's that popular Netflix series, The Queen's Gambit. She loved to play The Queen's Gambit. Well, then if, if that's the kind of mm, style of game that you do well in, then great, mm-hmm. go for that. 
So, so one is the importance of knowing what kind of games you like. That's important. And, and also of developing heuristics. Heuristics, an important word, important concept. And a heuristic is just a fancy word for a rule of thumb. It's a shorthand. It's like a, a heuristic is a recipe for solving a particular little teeny subset problem. And so in chess, the chess master over, over studying, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of games develops heuristics, which is little rules of thumb about the game that guide his decision-making. And it's not optimal. I'm going to underscore, it's not optimal. We, uh, we develop a, a rule of thumb. For example, uh, it's good to have your knights in the center of the board as opposed to on the edges of the board. Like that's a heuristic. That's a general principle. Um, now, it's not always the case. Not always true. And, but generally it's true. Mm -hmm. And so the importance of heuristics, what it allows the, 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 the master to do is to cut down the number of decision trees that he's going to examine. So heuristics are little shortcuts in our thinking. So here's a heuristic, for example. Uh, don't fight the Fed, right? If the Fed is lowering interest rates and adding money to the U.S., financial system, then generally stocks are going to go higher, generally. Like, don't fight that. That's a heuristic. Now, it's not always right, but it allows you to, to get on the right side of things generally. One of my favorite quotes, uh, Damon Runyon was, uh, about a century ago, was a, a, a playwright, wrote musical comedies. He was a very funny guy. And uh, he said once, the race is not always to the swifter, nor battle to the stronger, but that's the way you bet, right? It's not always it's a game of probabilities. So chess is also a game of, of sort of developing little rules of thumb to help you navigate. So for example, someone's heuristic might be, I'm never trading the first half hour of the day, ever right? That that's just their heuristic because it's too volatile, say, right? And, and then that person has that in his repertoire. So chess, um, I remember Fisher once told me we were looking at a position and he put his hand, his right hand, and his hand, he was enormous, like 6'3". He um, had really big hands. And he put his hands over his pieces, over the bulk of them. Like, not all of his pieces, but he, and, and he said, like a, a, like a basketball player palming a basketball. And he said, uh, it's really important that your pieces stay close together to each other. So, right, so they, because then they can protect each other. And his way of encapsulating that heuristic was he put his hands over the pieces. So he knew his, in his mind, intuitively, if a piece moved too far away from the others, he'd know something was wrong or there was, that was a dangerous thing to, to undertake. You better know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. I'd say that's, those are the two key things about chess that apply to markets. And it's things we've already discussed, right? Having a system, knowing what you play well in and steering the game as much as you can to, to those positions. And then having little rules of thumb that you're going to use. Yeah. And uh, in real time, very important that you have those rules of thumb in real time and repeat them. They should be like little mantras. Yeah, that interesting and you talked about earlier on you talked about how different groups or crowds of traders um 
position themselves in the market and how that you're taking signals from that to help with your investment ideas, positions, et cetera. We touched on it earlier, you know, bond traders, uh, metal traders. Can you, can you possibly explain, you know, the overriding concepts at work there? Who, who are the best and who are the worst groups that you've sure. sort of determined over time? Sure. So, so if we look at the market, the market consists of different groups of traders. And just to simplify things, the market consists of stock traders, right? That they express their view of the future via stocks. You've got bond traders who are still trying to express the same view of the world, right? Whatever that view is, but they trade via bonds, right? So you've got stock traders, you've got bond traders, you've got uh, uh, metal traders, uh, oil traders and currency traders. Those are the five main categories of, of traders who are trying to make sense of the world. Right? And by the world, I mean the global economy. Right? And that's different from, say, traders in commodities like sugar. Right? There, they're trying to predict, you know, sugar demand, but that's not really the global economy, right? The price of sugar moving up or down is unlikely to have an impact on the global economy in any big way, yeah. whereas the price of oil moving up or down is going to have a huge impact. So each of those groups, traders, again, stock, bond, metal, currency, and oil, tries to make sense of the same world. And they express that view in their respective domains. And, and I told you earlier that bond traders and equity traders, when they disagree, the bond traders are right and early. Most of the time, all the, all the different groups of traders agree about the world. Like today in uh, LA, it's overcast. And I haven't uh, checked the, the temperature but uh, Fahrenheit, I'm going to say it's 65 degrees, say, ish, 65, maybe 70, I don't know, 65 probably. And if I ask people, I just took a random survey of people, what's the temperature like today? People would probably say it was cool. Some might say it, it was warm, right? Especially if they come from a cold, <laughs> uh, cold region, they come to 65, 65 is pretty good. And then again, Fahrenheit. And, and um, but nobody's going to say it's freezing at 65 degrees. It's not, no one's going to say it's freezing. No one's going to say it's, it's boiling hot either. It's tropical, Adam. How can you deal with that 65 degree weather? And so most of the time, those five groups of traders agree about the world. And what we're interested in is when they begin to disagree. And and uh, equity traders, in my ranking of, of those five categories, equity traders are in third place. And above equity traders are bond traders. So again, when bond traders and equity traders disagree about the state of the world, uh, about the future of the world, the bond traders are right and early, 19 times out of 20. Very reliable. Um, but above bond traders are metal traders. And, and uh, in so first place, metal traders, second, bond traders, third, equity traders, uh, fourth place, oil traders, and fifth place, currency traders. And by that, I mean, if I wanted to detect a long-term trend change in currency markets, I know that equity traders would do a better job of it, even though the equity traders aren't as it were, trying to predict currency markets. They're not trying to do that. Any more than metal traders are trying to predict interest rates. They're just trying to predict, sorry, uh, metal demand. And yeah. so one key indicator I use for predicting US 10-year yields, but global 10-year yields, is copper divided by gold. So copper divided by gold mm -hmm. Is, is the way metal traders express their view of 
interest rates. And when copper divided by gold is going up, metal traders are positioning for higher interest rates. And, and I know that when, when copper divided by gold is going up and, and longer term interest rates like 10 year yields are going down, I know that the metal traders are right in early. And at every major turning point in the last 15 years, metal traders have been on the right side of interest rates. So that's an example of how I use these different groups of, I mean, that's it in broad strokes. I'm not going to reveal all my secrets, but, but that's it in broad strokes. Mm. So, yeah, so those are the, the different groups of, of traders. Oil traders are in fourth place because the sovereign nations that control the supply also trade it, right? All the, the OPEC nations, other sovereign states that, that control the supply of oil in the world also trade the hell out of it, <laughs> right? So you're, you're going up against an asymmetry of information. They got a big edge over you. Wow. But here's, a, here's an example. For example, I, 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 okay, talking about oil. And, uh, I know that, again, at top dog are metal traders and uh, fourth place are oil traders. So I know when copper and when metal traders who express their view of the world in economy wise by buying copper, say, and if they're bullish on the economy, they'll buy copper and sell gold. And, and I know that, um, that if energy traders are bullish on the economy, economic activity, they'll buy oil, right? I know this. And, and I know when they disagree, the metal traders are right, um, probably against oil traders, right and early, uh, seven or eight times out of 10. Mm -hmm. They'll lead, um, they'll lead, and copper will lead oil most of the time. Um, so I, I know that if copper starts going higher, well, here's a perfect example. Last year, exactly a year ago, you may remember on April 23rd last year, oil prices settled negative. Yeah. Right? I think it was April 23rd last year. And so oil was, was at an all-time low. It had gone negative, right? <laughs> like when, talk about economic models. This is Alice in Wonderland territory. And, but copper was, if people go back last year, they would see the copper bottomed, I think it was on March 17th, 17th or 18th or 19th, uh, may have bottomed on the 20th, which is when equities bottomed. And then copper was zooming higher and oil bottomed about a month later. So I knew that oil was going to turn around and follow copper. Right? I, I knew this because, yep. again, seven times out of 10, uh, metal traders, when they disagree with oil traders, the metal traders are right. How are they positioning themselves today in this, in this environment? Are you seeing anything interesting? So right now, there's a, a great battle going on um, with the inflation narrative. So, so in general, but not yeah. always, and we're going to get to this, inflation is better than deflation, right? Better that that prices be increasing than decreasing. Because if they're decreasing, deflation is a sign of declining economic activity. That's bad. And prices rising, although we don't like it, it's a sign of economic activity, which in general is good. And, and so um, the secular trend for the last decade has been deflation low to no growth, uh, we're in a low to no growth world right now and have been for the last dozen years. And that's a secular thing that goes by secular, I mean, super long-term, not just multi-year, but multi-decade. And the secular trend in the world is one of population decline. 
And most people haven't really, even when I tell them, they go, what? what are you talking about population decline? Isn't the world overpopulated? No, it's actually shrinking. So for the last decade, the US, uh, Canada, uh, Great Britain, uh, every country in Europe, Japan and Australia, more people died every year than were born. You really have to get your head around that. More people died in Europe. This is pre-COVID, I'm not talking about COVID. More people died than were born. It's shrinking. So if, the, if population is shrinking and also family formation has plummeted, right? If you think about your peers, Ed, and you say, how many people are rushing to get married and have lots of kids? Not many. Yeah. Right. Whereas a generation ago, it was just routine. You went to uni and you got a good job and you found someone and you started to have kids, lots of them. Not anymore. And so the secular backdrop in the world is one of declining population. The only regions that are growing are uh, emerging markets, really. And uh, the Middle East and Africa is basically it. Really, the only two, re- and some other areas, like some South American countries, but mostly developing countries. I, I hate that distinction, but but anyway, developing countries they're still growing, but at a much slower rate, and they don't make up for the collapse in the population of larger company uh, countries. So you got population collapse in the develop in the developed world and consumption plummeting, right? Home ownership and such, massive declines. Uh, and so the the multi year to multi decade trend is one of slowing to negative growth because of that, and so. So you said, I say all that by way of backdrop. So that's the secular trend, the long-term trend. But every once in a while, the world begins to think, oh, well, the central banks have thrown trillions of dollars into the global economy. So that money has got to go somewhere. So we got to have inflation. So US interest rates, which hit an all-time low last I think early August, last early August, they were like, I think the intraday low was like 0.3% on a 10 year. But today, the 10 year yield is up at 1.5%. Now, historically, interest rates rising, you know, 1.5%, that's really low to borrow money for 10 years and pay only 1.5%. But it's It's a 5X move from where it was last August, 5X. Here's a shocking factoid for you, Ed. Japanese interest rates are at five-year highs. Yeah. Yeah, five-year highs. Remember, everyone thought Japanese interest rates, they were the first ones to go negative, right? About seven, eight years ago, something like that. I believe that their equity markets are all-time highs as well. Yeah. Yeah, well... I don't know if they're at all-time highs. Hold on a sec, my friend. I thought we'd have broken out of the... Hold on. All-time highs in 1989. <laughs> so wait. I th- I... Let me just check. <laughs> the Japanese stock market is doing super well, and it's outperforming the rest of the world. I will say that. But I just looked at a chart. No, it's... So in 1989, 1989, mind you, right? That's 31 years ago, Ed. <laughs> Yeah, um, the Japanese stock market hit like thirty nine thousand. Okay, and right now it's twenty five percent less than that. Okay, that's after thirty one years. If you would buy and hold, uh, that's staggering. That's not such a good return. But obviously, the, the opposite of a good return. Imagine I'm going to buy and hold this stock. Japanese equities forever, you, you've lost, and you bought in ni- uh, 1989, 
you're, look, you're looking at a 25% loss over the last 31 years. At the same time, every other global market in the world is like up, you know, I don't know, 5X or 10X something. And, uh, but Japanese equities are on a tear. They've been really outperforming global equities. Um, and so, so what's going on in the market now, I would tell everyone, is a real battle between the inflation narrative and, and deflation, right? So the longer term, think of it this way. Think of the deflation as the global climate. It's deflation. But you can have weather periods, like could be like hot weather. The climate is increasing temperatures, but for a year, things could get colder than normal. Right. And so with with the inflation narrative, there's a real battle going on here mm-hmm. because I don't see how the global economy, which has been really crushed by uh, COVID and was not in a good way even before COVID. Right. Markets at all time highs because governments have been printing money like nobody's business. And that money has to go somewhere. Essentially, the global economy has been on mass steroids mm-hmm. for the last, since the 07, 08 crash, really. And, and so, and why has it been on steroids? And by that, I mean, right, printing money. Because the secular backdrop is one of declining yeah. growth. And the central bankers haven't really got their head around that. Anyway, so what I'm looking at right now, because we're at an inflection point. So this is March 3rd, you and I are talking. And we are in the next two to three weeks, we will find out whether the inflation narrative has essentially maxed out and that the the secular trend of deflation is going to reassert itself. Either that or the inflation narrative is actually going to take hold and but it's not good inflation. It'll be higher commodity prices and higher interest rates Mm -hmm. at a time when the world assumed interest rates were gonna stay low forever, right? And and, and think about how many projects have been undertaken over the last few years, expecting interest rates to be super low. And now they're going to multi-year highs. Uh Uh-oh. Yeah, got it. Like th- their business models weren't, didn't allow for possibility, right? And so, so that's what's being waged right here. And it's an interesting point because if indeed um, the inflation narrative takes hold, then it's likely we're moving into a period of stagflation, which is w- the last time we saw that was in the 70s which is that prices were going up, but it wasn't because of economic activity. It was because of, well, at this point, it would be supply shocks to the world. Yeah. And that may be what the market is kind of sniffing out, is supply shocks, trade imbalances, things like that, that are going to drive up prices. And so, so that's, that's what I'm watching right now. And, and it'll, the, the beauty of that is, and the reason I'm saying, so you're, you're every listener, this is March 3rd, is that if U.S. interest rates today, let me just check them here where they are. Um, I think they're like 1.48, something like that, 10-year yields. Yeah, 1.48. Um, if they're significantly higher in two weeks, then we're, we're likely moving into a stagflation period. Wow. Which can last Which months to years of just negative for equities as well. Yeah, that would not be good for equities. Now, not, yeah. but wait a second. This is real important for your listeners. Because <clears throat> within such a world, I know that uh, stocks that like inflation are, um, which includes higher interest rates, banking stocks, energy stocks, and material stocks. The value. 
But no, no, I didn't say that. I didn't no. word value. I said energy stocks, material stocks, and banking stocks. Yeah, sorry, more specifically. Yeah. Really well in, in, in inflationary periods when interest rates are going up. So even though the broad market might not be doing too well, I know that those sectors will be doing mm. exceedingly well on a relative basis. Yeah, very interesting. Right? Now, by the way, you were exactly right. I just wanted to point out you were right. Um, but I, I didn't want your listeners to get the wrong. Um, growth stocks have trouble when interest rates are going higher, right? So value stocks tend to outperform. You are correct in that. But I just wanted to state more precisely that it's energy stocks, material stocks, and banking stocks. And so, so uh, whereas other sectors will struggle with, with the new environment. Right. Yeah. And and so again, if but if interest rates are significantly lower two weeks from now, then we're back to the deflation scenario. Yeah. Which is lower interest rates, lower commodity prices, higher dollar. Um, and then. And then I know that tech stocks will outperform. Yeah. And that the, uh, the energy, material and banking stocks, they're going to underperform. And, and that'll be decided again in the next couple of weeks. So this is actually an exciting yeah, yeah. inflection point. And you, you're watching the 10-year as your indicator. Yeah. yeah. And I, again, which is another really important concept, is to keep things simple. So when I look at yields, I look at 10-year yields. Right? I might look at 10-year bond yields versus U.S. 10-year yields. But I just use 10-year yields as kind of a long-term enough. And I've done studies and they're a better indicator on, on a lot of levels than longer-term bonds, like 20-year yields, right? Um, so, so 10-year yields is just what I choose. And it's really important that, you know, we talked about heuristics with chess players and having simple rules of thumb yep. is to simplify the number of things you look at. Right. Don't. One of my concepts, you know, that I've talked a lot about is is reducing the amount of information you're looking at, because the more information you get, the harder it is to think about everything. You, you, you lose the forest for the trees. So, yeah, when I talk interest rates, 99 times out of 100, I mean, 10 year yields. Awesome. That's been great, Adam. I really enjoyed uh, getting into your mind about how you think about markets. And I thought we could just round off uh, the interview with uh, a little bit uh, on, on sort of your, your perspectives on life and uh, philosophy. Um, what, what is the great game to you? So, so this is really important, you know, and, and we, there's so many brilliant people in the world and I, uh, like Jordan Peterson, for example, and, you know, he, he's got his 12 rules for life. And he came out with a new book, like another 12. That's 24 rules. That's a lot for me. I have a Cocoa Puff brain. I can't keep track of 24 things. <laughs> I have trouble keeping track of, you know, really two or three things. And, you know, and, and then you've got a, a brilliant guy like Ray Dalio with principles. You know, it's like a five or 600 page book. There's no way I could master that. And there's just no way. And so I try to reduce life down to a few simple rules, right? Heuristics, even life. And, um, and I, I, this, I think this is really powerful. And, and that is that to learn to control your attention. And your attention in life should be on one of two things either on the task at hand, if you're alone, whatever the task is, or on the person in front of you. So if I'm alone, I don't think there's anybody more introverted than I am. But the second someone else enters my environment, my attention is totally on that person. Totally. And, and, and that's, if you can master that, 
uh, again, your attention's on the task at hand or the person in front of you. And, and, and to go back when your attention is on the person in front of you in a playful way, and you're fully engaged in the other person, then, then you're not thinking about yourself. And in both situations, you're thinking about the task at hand, like Jordan thinking about his shot. That's all he's thinking about. Or Brady trying to look for a receiver, right? He's a little bit, he's got to worry about the, you know, being tackled and getting crushed, but really his attention is finding a receiver. So that's a really powerful uh, tool is attention mastery. Again, when you're alone, your attention should be on the task at hand, whatever it is. And then when you're among others, your attention should be totally on them. Whether it's you're in a boardroom meeting or, or going for an interview or you're on a date, then, then there's no room for self-doubt or fear or anger even. It's, it's a way to control negative emotions. And it's just a better way to be. And so the great game that I wrote a book and I'm going to release it. I wrote it four years ago and haven't uh, maybe a few hundred people that I, I love have read it, but amazing. I'm going to release it this year. And it's all about playing, playing the life, just life as a game. It's a really serious game. And, and to be playful and enthusiastic always. And in all, when I, I mean this literally, when I step into an elevator, I'm excited when the door opens up. I wonder who's going to be in that elevator. I mean that literally. I'm real excited. And when I step into a, a taxi, I'll strike up a, a conversation with the, with, the, with, the, with the driver and wonder where it'll go and what I'll learn and, uh, and have fun in the meantime. Now, there are, of course, times when I get into a cab and I just want to, you know, th- I'm musing on something or just want to listen to some music or be quiet. But generally, when I say generally, almost always, if, I'm, if anyone is in my environment, they've got my 100% attention. And I'm having a blast doing it. And so I think that's really important. Attention management. Yeah, thanks, Adam. It's a really good, good note to uh, finish on. Um, and uh, I thank you again for, for your time because it's been really interesting, as I said, to dive into how you look at the markets. And um, well, I know that people will find it incredibly valuable. Um, if people want to follow your insights and, and you know, hear about when, when you release this, uh, your new book, The Invitation to the Great Game, I believe. Yes, and it's a great game. But also... How Not to Be Stupid, which Warren Buffett endorsed. I have that book also I haven't released. Oh, wow. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Warren said, this book is loaded with good ideas and appropriate warnings. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, I'm going to release that too. And, and uh, this, follow me on Twitter or, you know, I, I'm not on Instagram that much, but both I am Adam Robinson. Okay, brilliant. Somebody wants to DM me and I don't. I don't, I don't have much time, but I, and I try to, what time I do have, I try to share insights broadly with, you know, anyone who follows me. Yep. Um, so there. Well, thanks, Adam. Um, no really appreciate you, your time. And um, yeah, have a great rest of the week. And, and now hopefully maybe we'll get a chance again to catch up with you in the future. I mean, of course we will, Ed. Always. <laughs> great. Um, ditto. Have a wonderful week. Bye, Adam. Thanks for listening, everyone. Just a quick note before we sign off. If you're looking for an easily digestible daily update on the markets, this might be of interest. Opto Updates is our short newsletter sent every day during the trading week, giving you a bulleted list of the top seven stories from the global stock markets. We've done the hard work for you, highlighting relevant opportunities and trends. And in addition, we'll also keep you notified of any new products, stock reports, or webinars from the Opto world. If you're interested, sign up using the link in the show notes. And thanks also to Kofruition for consulting on and producing the show. Until next time.